Good evening, buenas noches. My name is Denise Lay, and I'm the Operations Manager and also a Victim Advocate here at Homicide Survivors. Thank you for joining us tonight. This year, the theme for National Crime Victims Rights Week is Access, Equity, and Rights. Over the past two years, we've had a significant and unfortunate rise in homicides. That's why we at Homicide Survivors decided to team up with our community partners and walk you through the process of when a homicide first occurs. Please remember that no one deserves to endure the murder of a loved one alone. We are here to help. And now a few words from our community partners. My name is Dan South. I'm the Chief Criminal Deputy here at the Pima County Attorney's Office. I supervise the Criminal Division um, and we have around 60 to 70 criminal prosecutors as well as a robust support staff of around 200 people. Um, when we respond to a homicide, typically we'll get a phone call from the detective sergeant of the homicide unit with our law enforcement partners. Um, we are on call 24-7, 365 days a year, and often we'll get a phone call from that sergeant in the middle of the night. We have a dedicated phone line, um, and the, our law enforcement partners know to call that phone number. Uh, we'll respond in the middle of the night. Typically, we'll get a briefing from uh, the sergeant about what the scene uh, is like, what it involves, and what to expect. When we arrive on scene, we'll typically part, be part of the walkthrough to get an idea of what the scene looks like, what evidence is on scene, um, and, and try to assess from there. Um, because we are the prosecution agency, down the road we often have these cases um, as, as pending criminal matters. So it's incredibly important for us to be there on scene um, meeting with the detectives, the officers that are, that are taking the evidence, um, and to see firsthand with our own eyes what the crime scene looks like. Um, it, it pays dividends down the road when we're in a jury trial, um, and we were there firsthand um, experiencing what the scene looked like. Um, we have a team of major crimes prosecutors that are, that are on call. Uh, we have about seven attorneys that are in the major crimes division. And uh, depending on what type of homicide we're looking at, uh, we try to get the, the expert in that field, the person who's most experienced in that type of crime. So we have special victims prosecutors as well. If unfortunately it happens to be a child victim or something that involves special victims, we'll send those attorneys out to the scene. Uh, so this past year, our entire country has faced unprecedented uh, crime spikes, especially involving violent uh, crimes and homicides. Um, in our county here, uh, it's been no different than, than our country coast to coast. Uh, we have had a surge in homicides. Um, typically, we're looking at homicides that are, that are 60 or 70 um, incidents per year. This last year broke records in the city of Tucson with 93 homicides. Uh, across Pima County, it was well over 100. Um, this year so far, and we're only in April now, uh, there are at least 20 homicides uh, that have been reported here in Pima County, um, and we've been out to nearly every single one of those. Um, we are seeing this trend continue, and we're working proudly with the Tucson Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, and other agencies to, to address this and find out how we can work together to, to stop this uh, crime wave from continuing. So in my role as chief criminal deputy here, I meet with victims and families of victims every single day. And uh, one of the questions that I hear over and over again is, why does it take so long? We're frustrated. We want justice. You know, our, our loved one is gone and we need to be able to move on. Um, what's really important in the conversation that I have with these families is that it's more important to get it right, not rushed. We want to ensure that we are complying with all of the obligations on on our shoulders. Um, behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. We have, um, from the time a case comes in, we have many, many hearings. Um, and we have to ensure that all the disclosure, all of the evidence is pr produced to the other side. Um, one thing I'm always concerned about is um, going through a case, having a family support us the entire way through. Um, when we get to the end of that case, and if there is a conviction, we want to ensure that the integrity of that conviction um, withstands appellate review. So I always warn families that have patience with us, um, but we want to make sure we get it right. So um, while it takes a long time for cases to come through, and oftentimes it takes a year, sometimes more, um, but we want to ensure that we're doing everything we can to um, give the rights to the people that are accused um, and have the evidence come to us 
um, from some of the experts in the field. Oftentimes, we're waiting on forensic evidence, uh, DNA, forensics, uh, ballistics. Uh, these are things that take oftentimes months, but we want to get it right. We want to let the science dictate what the evidence is um, because it's just as important uh, that we convict a, a guilty person as it is that we exonerate a person who's innocent of the crime charged. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about why a criminal case takes so long to go through the system is that the attorneys are overworked, they have too high caseloads, um, and there's just too much going on. Um, while there are high caseloads, it couldn't be further from the truth. We have experienced prosecutors working on these cases um, from the very beginning, going out to the scene, all the way through the con conviction and appeal process. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes that the general public just doesn't see. Um, we have attorneys that are, that are going to each of the hearings, and you might see them in court, but then they go back to their office and we'll have witness interviews for every one of those witnesses. Um, and we'll actually have a formal recording where the parties will come in and the defense attorney is there and they get to ask questions. Um, so those witness interviews often take months to set up, um, depending on how uh, big the case is. Uh, often we're waiting on forensic evidence and things like DNA, ballistics, uh, this sort of, of forensic evidence um, it takes months sometimes to process through the system. Um, so we want to ensure that we are um, getting all of that evidence in, evaluating it, and being prepared for our cases as they go through the system. Yeah, you might see your, your attorney in, in court, or the, the, the state's attorney, the prosecutor in court, um, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks. Um, but there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes um, to prepare for a case. So, so I'm often asked what the reason for this crime spike is. Why are homicides higher this, this year than they've been in the past? Um, you know, part of that, I think, might be the pandemic. Um, a lot of people have been cooped up, dealing with a lot of stress. A lot of people are out jobs. Um, they've been forced into different areas. So, you know, I think mental health is really on, on the top of all our minds. And one thing I want to reiterate is the Pima County cr uh, Crisis Healthline. Uh, 622-6000. That's 520-622-6000. And if you know somebody who's dealing with mental health uh, issues, ensure that they get the help that they need. And, and Pima County is right there on the front lines trying to get people um, the help that they desperately need. I think that's the one uh, factor that carries through the, the spike in, in homicides that we've seen here. So a typical day as a victim advocate usually includes fielding phone calls to sometimes responding on scene with law enforcement. However, a majority of the time it is um, going to court and assisting victims there and case managing about 60 to 85 cases. Currently, we have about 20 to 21 victim advocates here, um, with each ranging about 60 to 80 cases. So law enforcement pages us through a texting system. From there, we triage the page and determine if there is a need for a death notification or specifically going on out on scene and assisting. Um, once we have gotten a little bit more information is when we respond on scene and we're pretty much there. Our goal is to be there as support for the families. Um, that could include next steps, which means like funeral homes to um, connecting them with our community partners, such as homicide survivors. When we get to the court process, though, our biggest job there is to manage expectations um, because these cases can be pretty lengthy. So that is one of the hardest things for victim representatives or next of kin is understanding that a process like this could take years. Um, so we're there in any way to help. So I am a bilingual victim advocate here at the county attorney's office. Um, one of the things we do see a lot in, for instance, homicide cases is the difficulty um, for victim representatives who don't speak English or live out of state or out of the country and know a completely different criminal justice system. So part of our role is to explain that to them and walk them through it as well as provide them support in whatever way possible.
Um, so the community can access victim services by, as mentioned before, um, law enforcement who pages us out on scene and requests our assistance. The other way and the primary way is through the main line, which is for victim services at 520-724-5525. And there is always an advocate available to answer any questions or assist in any way possible. Victim services ensures equity and inclusivity for all crime victims, regardless of their status, background, language, age, preferences, to ensure they are aware of their victim rights. Some of those victim rights include the right to attend any or all court hearings, to provide input in court proceedings, and to speak with the prosecutor in regards to the status of a case. Um, this is just to name a few. There is a full list of these rights in the Arizona Victim Bill of Rights. And I think that's the, the biggest misconception with next of kin or victim representatives is that question, right? Because they want sometimes that closure, right? Immediately or as soon as they bury their loved one. And it's not like that. It the evidence has to be combed through from both sides. They all have to review everything. It also has, there's a process of the homicide panel where it has to be presented to attorney, supervising attorneys to know if they are going to offer a plea or if it's going straight to trial. Not to mention trial prep, all those type of things take lots of time. Um, and the other thing to remember is Pleas can be offered, but a defendant doesn't have to take it. So it could be especially hard when at trial and having to be seen or shown all this evidence as well. So most cases are domestic violence oriented. So during the pandemic, there was that period of time where people had to stay home and you saw a lot more of domestic violence cases, but to those that escalated to homicide. The way Tucson Police Department responds to a homicide is, is pretty extensive. So typically I receive a phone call from a patrol sergeant who's out in the field and they um, more often than not responded to some kind of violent act, whether it be a shooting, a stabbing, um, an extensive fight. Uh, they respond to that scene, kind of triage everything, identify one that is a possible homicide, how many witnesses, how many suspects, and how many scenes there are. Because sometimes we'll you know, have two, three, four different scenes, uh, car chase or, or something after the fact. I get a phone call usually in the middle of the night and um, the ball starts rolling from there. So um, I'll get briefed from that patrol sergeant and then I determine how big of a department response is warranted for each case. Um, the minimum number of homicide detectives that I would respond to a scene with is four. Uh, occasionally I'll have all eight of my detectives on scene and then I'll determine what um, support uh, units I want available at that um, call. So if there's some kind of gang nexus, I'll have um, our gun crime reduction unit respond who they handle gang inve investigations and they'll support um, you know, my investigation. If the homicide was a domestic violence incident, I'll call the domestic violence unit and they'll send some representatives. Um, and then, you know, if it was a sexual assault homicide, of course, we, we're fortunate that we have specialty units in each area and they'll come assist the TPD homicide unit. But homicide always takes primary on investigations. Um, from there, we have availability of uh, surveillance and intelligence units that come to the scene. They get briefed up right away and they'll start um, trying to locate um, suspects if they're outstanding. Sometimes they're all in custody. You know, take a domestic violence incident. We've had calls where husband calls and says, I, you know, I just killed my wife. You know, that one, there's not a uh, follow up to go try to find anyone, but there's an extensive investigation. We have crime scene. Uh, multiple crime scene units show up um, and then we obviously make some um, department commander notifications as well. Once I get on scene and get briefed, I call the county attorney's office. They send a representative out to every homicide 
And that's very beneficial for uh, a scene walkthrough and a thorough briefing about what we have at the initial incident. And then on occasion, when suspects flee, uh, it makes um, getting an arrest warrant, if we have probable cause for one, uh, much uh, smoother and quicker. So if people flee jurisdictions or um, you know hide um, in the city, um, then we're armed with an arrest warrant uh, to take them into custody. Later on in the night, um, our um, lead detective who's assigned the case always does death notifications, him or herself. And uh, that's where we really rely on uh, some support uh, from victim services who will respond 24 seven. Um, if next to kin notification is local, we always have that option uh, to have them there so we can give survivors um, services immediately. Um, sometimes families don't want it right away. Sometimes they're not in a, a place to um, kind of know they need it, if you will. Um, and then they can always follow up at a later time. And then usually within the next day or two, we notify uh, homicide survivors who uh, will conduct some follow up and, and get the survivors' families um, plugged in on services that that organization offers. So. Um, We've gone, you know, a short homicide scene is six or eight hours, and then we've worked three days straight, um, you know, without getting any sleep, depending on where it goes. So it, it, it's, it's quite a process. The homicide rate for 2021, we had a, a record year of 93 homicides in the city limits. The year prior to that, 2020, we had... Um, 68 and the year prior to that 2019 we had 49 so we're clearly on a upward trend um, this year to date we've had 18 and last year year to date we had 21 so it's certainly not a significant drop off our summers are typically our highest um, response to homicides um, just people out of school, a lot of free time, and uh, a lot of you know, bad things happening. So um, unfortunately, you know, our tr we're trending up. The um, average you know, roughly is high 40s, low 50s, kind of looking over the last 10 years. Um, so I know the department response to this is massive. Uh, we have um, a lot of resources available to the homicide unit. There's, there's um, a lot of research and analysis going on, trying to find trends, looking at hot spots. Um, I'm very fortunate leading the homicide unit that I've, you know, I'm a phone call away. I can get surveillance units, I can get arrest teams, uh, SWAT team, additional detectives. Kind of being the the upper echelon of violent crime as far as you know homicides, uh, rapes, and robberies. Like the department has been very good as far as giving us additional resources. Um, to help fight this trend to where even to the point where we've increased the number of detectives in the homicide unit. Um, last year uh, we were, had about six and then uh, we've increased that to eight permanently just to address the sheer number of um, increase we've had. If I knew that answer, I'd win the Nobel Prize because I get asked it all the time. And we, there's literally a bank of analysts, um, one floor up from us, that have been studying that. We do not see a consistent um, single point of um, cause for any of it. You know, we've had homicides over parking spaces at a convenience store. Homicides of someone's looking at someone wrong or, or hit the horn at a stoplight. We've had drug-related homicides, we've had domestic related homicides and, and, you know, just for studying 93 of them last year in depth, we don't see a significant um, growth in one area. It's a growth in all areas and it's frustrating. Um, and, I, and I don't know if people have short fuses from COVID, short fuses from watching the news too much and, and, and you know, having a jaded uh, perspective on life. But um, I, I wish it was simple to address because I know the department, you know, if it was all gang violence, we could address that. It's really spread out over a wide area. 
and it, it's tough. You know, we go to conferences or phone calls or other agencies fly in to work their cases in our jurisdiction or vice versa. So we network um, nationally and everyone's having a spike and um, no one sees a constant, you know, single cause. So um, it's really taxed homicide units across the country. And um, yeah, 2021 was a tough year, not only for me, but for my staff. I mean, you know, just think of 93 scenes, 93 families. Um, thank goodness, you know, like victim services and homicide survivors, we have a good support system that has really uh, helped us meet the needs of the community. And so we've had families that uh, want some answers, um, you know, want to share information. And, and both those organizations have liaison with that family to where um, we've had out of town families that have made arrangements to fly in. They had a long list of questions. Um, homicide survivors consolidated those questions, sent uh, me an email, and, and we did, you know, I met with the family and the case detective in this very room, sat with them for an hour and a half when they flew in from out of town. They were from Mexico. And that, that's a, in a very efficient use of time. So I don't have to pull that lead detective off work in that case and other cases um, with multiple phone calls to the family and having those services is just priceless. The main things that I see families getting frustrated with, it, it, these homicides do take a, a, a lot of time. There is no other case that um, I'm aware of in any agency that takes a priority over a homicide case. So all of our resources are dedicated to solving these crimes. Um, the main barriers that I see are um, reluctant witnesses, um, and then the uh, length of time for uh, forensics to get completed. Um, our lab is amazing. We're fortunate enough to have a major crime lab for our agency. A lot of other agencies have to send um, forensic testing out to like Department of Public Safety. We do it in-house, but there is a huge backlog. So if you take 93 homicides and you take, you know, 5, 10, 15 DNA samples from each homicide, you've got um, shell casings, you got fingerprints, all of that just builds up. And then the crime lab has to prioritize what testing needs to be done. And that's on top, and that's just homicide. And think about robberies and rapes and, and so forth. So it, it, it's a huge process. We adjust our priorities um, frequently. Um, we do our best to communicate with the families um, why things are taking longer. Um, and, you know, it, it's, that's, again, where we've used victim services and homicide survivors to help liaison um, because some of these families, particularly the ones that are out of town, uh, can't uh, swing by the office and or if they realize, hey, I've called the detective on Friday and it's Monday and they haven't called me back. Well, they may not know we've ha we're out on two other homicides that week. Um, so um, that's where those organizations are, are really helping us. In Pima County, we're very, very fortunate with the victim services um, that are offered the, both at the county attorney's office and organizations like Homicide Survivors. We are truly uh, partnered with them. You know, we're a city agency. Homicide Survivors is an NGO and uh, Victim Services is a county organization. Um, from my standpoint, it's been seamless as far as if I pick up a phone, I've never been told no. You know, I, I've woken up uh, volunteers to come out at two in the morning and help us make a victim notification. You know, I've called homicide survivors and uh, I have, you know, surviving families in Mexico. I have two Spanish speaking detectives. If they're off a particular day, homicide survivor bilingual advocate will come in and translate. So um, we're fortunate as a community to have those two organizations to, to help a very busy homicide unit like TPD. I'm Sergeant James Brown of the Pima County Sheriff's Department. I'm the supervisor of the homicide unit with Pima County. Uh, I've got a group of eight to nine detectives that investigate crimes uh, related to homicide and very tenacious group that is out there to assist with the victims' families to maybe not necessarily give closure, but to hold the people accountable for the actions that they take.
My name is Linda Balbastro. This is my son Patrick, who was um, murdered in the year 2014, first of the year, um, New Year's Day. Uh, he was murdered and with Cindy, he tried to help Cindy. And um, unfortunately, it was, uh, he got hurt really bad and, and didn't make it. He was 32 years old. He was an electrician. His work is all around here in Tucson. And he'd ask me if I wanted to go to California with him to go see his cousins. And I would go with him and that's when we had our good talks you know, long talks, um, and I would ask him uh, if he was going to get married. He wasn't married. He didn't have no children, and he said, no, not yet. He wanted to get all his priorities first, have a, which is get a home, you know, and, and then um, uh, he would, um, I asked him if he was going to give me a grandbaby, and he kind of like, chuckled and said no no he goes my nieces and nephews are my grand are my kids which was true because he took them to the show he would take them bowling you know and just uh take them eat to go have lunch pizza whatever you know but he was a very good uncle and um all through this after this ordeal horrible thing that um homicide survivors came in to the picture and helped a lot, a lot with his, with the funeral arrangements and um, and the court procedures, which oh my God, that was very helpful. You know, they made me understand how the court uh, system works. You know, and that was very helpful because I don't know, I barely could stay in that courtroom to listen to all that, you know, I didn't want to listen to it, so I would walk out. And um, they were there all the time, though. From day one, they were there. For people that have gone through this, you know, just want to let you know you're not alone. <clears throat> the emotions that you feel are, are, you know, just let them come. You know, try the understanding of them. You, you um, have these, all these hate and you cry and it's good it's good to cry you know you cry as much as you can because like i said it 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 helps it helps to cry and don't don't um bottle this in you whatever you do don't keep it in you keep on talking to somebody you know you have somebody and talk to them about it because you know you need that that's what um and Homicide Survivors is there for that. Primero que nada, buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Estela Lugo y mi hijo es Javier Araiza Lugo. Este, él lo mataron el 18 de septiembre del 2020. Las memorias que tengo de mi hijo Ah, son un poquito difícil de hablarlas, pero ah, son memorias bonitas. Era muy chistoso porque a él le gustaba mucho ah, comprar cachuchas y siempre, mamá, pero me puedes dar para esto. Ya me, me falta un poquito, no me falta todo el dinero que, que, que me cuesta, pero me puedes ayudar con un poco. Ah, entonces yo le decía, ah, Ok, pero que sea la última vez. Bueno, y me decía, ok, está bien. No, pues al otro día que regresábamos se le ocurrió otra cosa y todo el tiempo. Y un día me, pues ya, ya le compraba pues algunas cositas, ¿no? Y siempre esperando el que, entre más, más, siempre. Pero decía, oye, mamá, pero se me, se me antoja esa o cualquier cosa, ¿no? Bueno, está bien. Entonces ya una vez me dice, ama, ¿me puedes dar dinero? Y le dije, no, le dije, no, no, ¿para qué quieres? Y luego me dice, ay, dice, dice, no más, dice, para comprar algo. Y le dije, bueno, le dije, toma tres dólares. Y me dice, ama, ¿con tres dólares qué voy a comprar? Ay, no, mejor tenlos de regreso porque yo no puedo comprar nada con tres dólares. Y le dije, 
ay, pues de todas maneras, para que compres cochinero, yo le decía siempre. Pues no tiene caso. Y me dice él, no, dice, pero no te compras tres, con tres dólares nada. Y entonces yo le dije, bueno, ah, pues antes dámelos para acá de regreso. Y, y ya me dice él, oh, dice, bueno, pues dámelos para algo, me van a servir. <risa> y y lo, ya, pues ya, luego decía, ay, decía entre, entre, como decimos nosotros, entre, entre dientes, uh -huh. uh, ay, qué coda mi mamá, es muy coda porque no, no suelta nada, <risa> entonces ya le decía yo, oh, este, ya te escuché, chamaco, y me dice, ay, yo pensé que no me habías escuchado como lo estoy diciendo tan quedito, me decía, no, pues sí, fíjate que sí te escuché lo que me dijiste, y me dice, oh, ok, pues él como que todo ok, no le importa, si me escuchaste no me importa, pero pues ya, ni modo. Entonces, este, pues sí, ah, hay muchas, le digo, muchas memorias de él, muchos recuerdos bonitos, muchos recuerdos, pues, pues para mí siempre fueron muy bonitos, los, siempre van a ser los recuerdos bonitos porque, pues es lo que quiero quiero mantener conmigo, ese recuerdo bonito de él. Y siempre va a estar en mi corazón y en mi mente. Pues mi consejo sería que de verdad se acerquen a, a este servicio para poderlos a ayudar, porque sí, creo que sí nos ayudan mucho. Y pues como yo los podría, yo podría recomendar que sí se acerquen a esto, porque... Ah, la verdad, mi experiencia que yo he tenido con, con servicios de homicidio, pues sí, he sentido que, que me ayuda. Y pues ojalá que, que haya más personas que se quieran acercar a, a recibir estos servicios. Ah. Ahora, pues cuando yo, cuando yo este, entro a su cuarto... Todas las noches yo cierro la puerta de su recámara y cuando yo en la mañana lo abro, siempre espero que él esté ahí. Pero pues desafortunadamente veo la cama vacía. Ah. Todavía es, es muy difícil de, hacer el, de hacerme a la idea que él ya no está aquí y creo que para mí jamás me la voy a hacer. Cada día, pues, que van pasando es más fuerte, más fuerte. Más fuerte el dolor y, pues, sigo esperándolo. Bueno, pues, a mí me ha, me ha ayudado a servicios de homicidio. A mucho, les podría decir que me ha ayudado muchísimo. Porque siempre han estado ahí para escucharme. A cualquier pregunta que yo tengo, les llamo, les estoy dando mucha lata muchas veces, pero yo me siento muy, muy apoyada y muy feliz de que, de que esté este servicio para ayudarnos. Y pues algunas veces yo llamo y pregunto mil veces lo mismo posiblemente, pero o repito lo mismo. Ah, pero las terapias que me han ayudado, que me han dado, yo estoy muy agradecida porque la verdad sí me siento mucho mejor. Porque como les digo, pues muchas veces uno puede contar mejor con otra gente que con la propia familia. Desafortunadamente hay muchas veces que la familia lo escucha, pero como que hoy oh, estás loca o vas a volver a empezar a hablar de lo mismo. Y... Y pues uno pues se desilusiona de esas personas muchas veces porque realmente uno no espera esa actitud, espera algo mejor. Ah, porque uno cree que porque la familia le van a dar el apoyo diferente, ¿no? Pero realmente muchas veces no es eso lo que uno espera. Entonces de verdad que sí les agradezco mucho a a todos los que me han apoyado y pues a todo este servicio que, que nos han dado. 
Good evening. My name is Paloma Sainz and I'm a bilingual victim advocate for homicide survivors. I advocate because I believe all survivors should be heard. We provide advocacy, support, and assistance to those in the communities who have lost their loved ones to homicide. It is important for us at Homicide Survivors to ensure families are informed about their rights and get access to resources. No one should endure the murder of their loved one alone. Together, we can heal. Thank you for joining us this evening.